Well, thank you. I haven't even started yet. That's good, isn't it? Well, I hope you're well. My name's Alid, as Paul said, and it's a privilege to be sharing uh, a message this morning. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, then open them maybe to Matthew chapter 16. If you don't, the words will come up behind me. I want to start today by asking you all a question. And the question is this, what is the goal of your life? What's the goal of your life? Okay, what is the central driving factor that influences your motives, your decisions, and your time? And for the many of us in here that have been in church for a while and know the right answer to give, let me put it this way. How may someone else answer that question if they looked at your life over the last week, the last month, the last year? What would they conclude is the central driving factor in your life? And I find it an interesting question because wherever you look, you will find variations of answers. But generally, if you were to boil them down, it would probably be described in words such as this. Fulfillment, happiness, wealth, significance, security, comfort, almost every single time. In fact, this week, I just looked online at some kind of online surveys to see what people thought. And every time, these are the recurring themes that come back. People want to be happy. People want to have more. Now, I'm not saying that any of these things are bad. Of course they're not. We all want some of that, don't we? But the problem with all of them is that it brings all of our focus on either the here and now or the not-too-distant future. It's all about comfort now, isn't it? Or maybe, if we're lucky, it's when we retire, we build up something for that time. And I often spend time with friends who are trying so hard to achieve and to prepare for that kinds of ambition. But there's one thing that is sadly missing within that world perspective, within the world's view. It misses perspective. Allow me just to demonstrate here with a picture. I I want you to imagine that this rope that I've got just goes on and on and on forever. It doesn't, because it goes around there into the cupboard and then it ends somewhere. But I want you just to imagine that this goes on and on forever. It goes around the planet a few times. It goes all the way to the moon and back. And now I just want you to imagine that this little black bit on the end of the rope here is your time here on Earth. Your time here on Earth. I just want you to imagine that for a moment. Now, all of those things that we've just listed, all of those things within those surveys that I had a look this week, the vast majority even of the world, maybe even many of us in this room, live a life that is focused primarily, if not solely, on this bit here. On this bit here. And there is often very, very little thought, if I'm honest, about what happens Afterwards, what happens afterwards? But the Bible teaches us, the Bible teaches us that actually this is the reality of all of our lives. The reality of our lives is that even when your physical body dies, actually there is something of your soul, something of your inner being, which will continue to go on forever and ever and ever. And that is true as to whether you're a Christian or not. The truth is, is that you will continue to live forever. The question is, the question is, what will that life be like? The question is, what would that have in store for you when you die? Because you will go on. In the words of, is it Celine Dion? My heart will go on. (laughs) It will. She's right. The question is, what would it be like? Now, you may not believe that. You may think this is all just a bit crazy, but let me just use another illustration, another picture to try and help you understand something that is different about you and me. I just want to show a photo. Here's a photo of Jasper. Oh, isn't he sweet? He's dead. (laughs) But when he was alive, 
But when he was alive, you could have looked at me and Jasper and you could have said, there's some real similarities between Jasper and myself. I mean, he's got two ears, so have I. he's got two eyes, he's got a nose, a mouth. We're both rather cuddly. <laughs> we like sitting in front of a warm fire. We like food. Neither of us really like children chasing after us and pulling on us. <laughs> there are lots of things that are similar between me and Jasper, but there are some real notable differences too, and I'm not just talking about physical. All right? And this is where I really want, to un- I want you to understand something about what the Bible says. Not once, I promise you, not once in Jasper's life did I catch him looking up at the stars in wonder. Not once. Not once after he pooed yet again in my garden did I see him walking along and stop at a flower and just say, look at the colours of that flower. Just, just, sent it, just smelling something other than another cat's wee. Not once, we, we used to live on the, on the kind of near the old town, and every morning, beautiful, beautiful sunsets, red, orange, pink, purple. Not once did I see, when I pulled the curtains open in the morning, Jasper staring with his friends saying, wow. Not once. Not once did he do that. In fact, not only that, he couldn't do that. Because he was enabled, he was unable to wonder. And this is, this is really important because it highlights the difference between Jasper and me, the core difference between Jasper and myself. I say this because there is something so significantly different between Jasper and myself that it cannot be ignored and it cannot be explained through science, cannot be explained or ignored away. Now, Jasper is dead, And his heart will not go on. But that's because he was created as a physical being. He was created in a physical being. And not a spiritual one. He doesn't have a soul. He doesn't have an inner being like we do. And that's what it means when the Bible says that we were created in the image of God. It's not that God looks like us physically, it's that you were made as a spiritual being, like he is spirit. There is something different about the cat Jasper and me, because I have been made a spiritual being. Now, yes, I live in this physical body, but when that physical body goes, my inner, my spiritual soul will continue to go on. Someone's woken up. That's really encouraging. (laughs) That's what it means to be made in the image of God. What is it that makes you marvel at a sunset? What what is it? What, What is it that makes you experience delight and love or joy in the way that Paul Edworthy described last week? It's you. It's your soul. It's your inner being that is doing that. So why do I say that? Because this soul, this heart, this inner being of each and every one of us, when you physically die, it will go on, and it will go on, and it will go on. Your soul, this inner being, is going to be around way after your physical body Die. So let me just ask you again, what is the goal in your life? What is the goal to your life? Because if all you think about, if all you live for at the moment is for the sake of this little bit here, I'm hoping, I'm praying this morning that I might be able to just encourage you to gain a bit of a wider perspective into this bit here. Let me just read something that Jesus said to those who would love to follow him. He said this. Let's go to our passage, Matthew 16. He says this. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. But what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits 
his soul. And this is what Jesus is talking about. You have a world that is trying to gather up and store up for themselves everything for this life here, and they neglect to even think about, maybe even naive, maybe even unknowingly throw away the life that is here. What use is it for a man to store up treasures here and forfeit their very soul? Uh, as many of you may know, Lou, uh, the family, and myself, we're going to be moving to the Philippines. And it's been really interesting in conversations, talking to people. And you can tell sometimes in their eyes that they think, I'm just mad. They think we're crazy to throw away what we have, to go at what the cost will be. I think it's a pretty safe investment, don't you? Don't you? When you think about the world and how they just, they work so hard. They work every minute just to, to all the way along here just so that they can get a bit of enjoyment in retirement here. And they call me crazy. They call me crazy. Listen, as Christians... We have to live in light of eternity. We have to live in light of eternity. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about saying it or even it, believing it. I'm talking about living it in our lives, in our daily choices. But we need to be convinced of this if it's going to take reality in our life. So I just want to try and earth it a little bit. I just want to share just four ways, very briefly, in which living in light of eternity can radically change your life. All right, so there's no motivational speak. This is just truth from the gospel. But when you live in light of this, it will radically change everything about your life. And I'm just going to start with a really cheery number. Suffering. Suffering. Let me just start there. You see, when you're living in an earthly mindset, when you're living for the here and now, suffering is the last thing you want to experience, isn't it? Isn't that just the, the last thing you want to experience? It's the very opposite of what the world is looking for in comfort. It's the very opposite the world is looking for in happiness and fulfillment. And it breeds all kinds of disappointment, resentment, bitterness, depression. Because it actually, what it does, it robs you of that one chance of getting the fulfillment and the joy and the happiness you need because this is what you've got. This is all you've got. And it's robbing you of those things. And I look across the room and I know that there are many people that are hurting and in pain with lots of different suffering and different things. And let me tell you, if you're going to go through your suffering in a worldly mindset and say, this is what life is about, it's going to be paralyzing for you. But let me just tell you the joy of the gospel because we're living in light of eternity. If if you live in light of eternity, if you live in light of eternity, of eternity, It brings those trials and those hardships, as difficult as they may be, into a different perspective, don't they? Doesn't it? Because these momentary troubles are not the end of the story. They do not rob you of the opportunity to find life and fulfillment. In fact, the Bible teaches that it can even do the opposite, such as the currency of the kingdom of God. Let me just read from James 1. This is a passage that many of us will know very, be very familiar with. We don't necessarily like reading it when we're going through pain. It says this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Something that Paul said last week that I just thought was interesting. He said, you can have joy even through the tears. This is what James is talking about. Consider it pure joy, my brother and sisters, whenever you endure trials of many kinds. Joy? What joy? No one finds joy in happiness, in pain, sorry. No one finds joy in pain, do they? Well, they don't when it's all about the here and now. When you live for eternity, what does it say? It says, because you know 
that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. Listen, not lacking anything. Not lacking anything. You see, it's all about this, not this. When you live in light of eternity, God is more interested in preparing us and helping us walk through this in order that we may enter into the fullness of this even in our pain, even through our pain. There was a, a dear friend of many of ours, um, Reg Clark, who passed away um, quite a while back. And just a couple of weeks before he died, I had a quick conversation with him. And I must admit, I asked him a question in a worldly mindset. I said, Reg, how are you doing? And I don't know what you would have expected his answer to be. Mine was, obviously, he's, he's dying of cancer He's in pain, he's tired, he's weak, he's... Do you know what his answer was? My soul is well. That is someone who is living in an eternal mindset. Living in light of eternity, that regardless of the current trials and situations, he considers it pure joy that when he comes through the other side, it's like a doorway into the next chapter of his ongoing life for all eternity. He's living something in light of a different perspective than I even answered the, asked the question. In our suffering, we must live in light of eternity. What about this, number two? Generosity. Generosity. Who loves being generous? Hardly anyone. Brilliant. It's a short one, right? But I need to say this. It is so much easier to be generous and invest in the kingdom of God when you live in light of eternity and you're not engrossed in the now. Because the world says you hoard, you build up, you store for yourself, for riches, for happiness, for treasure. The kingdom turns out all on its head. Suddenly my investment now in the kingdom bears fruit for all of this time, not just for these few years. It's a different way of thinking. Jesus told a parable about a rich fool who he kind of stored up his grain, and he had so much it filled his barn to bursting. So what did he do? He went and built a bigger barn. And it goes on this way, and he finally gets to the point, and this is what the world says, you finally get to the point where you think, I've got enough. I'm just going to sit down on my Larry, and I'm just going to, what does he say? He says, I'll have plenty of grain laid up for many years. I'll take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And then what does God say? He says, you're a fool. He says, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? It's like that story, I don't know if you've heard it, of the, uh, the, the widow or the, the kind of the son or daughter who at the multi-millionaire's funeral, someone asked them, did he leave you anything? And they say, yeah, he's left everything. It doesn't matter how much you build up, you can't take it with you. What God says is, what are you going to invest in the kingdom that will last for eternity? The question isn't how much you have. The question is how you steward what you have. And in the currency of the kingdom, what you do now can have eternal consequences, both in the kingdom and even for yourself. That's what the Bible teaches. Um, I, um, a little while ago, did a, a course with a company called Stewardship, which is all about kind of raising funds and supporting yourself, because Lou and I, when we go away, we won't be able to get jobs. And there was something that someone said on there that I just found so interesting. He said this. He said, I can only be in one place at one time. He said, but I'm amazed to think that my money could be extending the kingdom in places around the world that I'll never even get to see. Do you hear that? that? That is living with eternity in mind. That's living with an eternal mindset. My, my money isn't just for me and my comfort in the here and now. Actually, I can plow and invest into the kingdom even if I don't find the benefit of it now. I, if I don't have the benefit of it now, but I know that it reaps a benefit in kingdom eternity. This is living in light of eternity. What about another one? What about faith and obedience? Hot topic in the New Testament, across the whole Bible actually. Faith in God and obedience. And you know, when I think of all the characters, all the people, in particularly Hebrews, 
I sometimes ask myself, if I was in their shoes, would I have done the faith steps that they did? Have you ever asked that? If you were Noah, would you have done what he did? In light of the criticism, in light of the mocking, in light of all those things. And sometimes, if I'm honest, I've got to say, I don't know if I would. But there's something about living with eternity in mind, something about having a perspective which is beyond the here and the now, that can help us be obedient to God and exercise faith in a way that is much more difficult to do if we value too highly this bit here. I wonder what would have happened in the story of Noah if he valued the words of man more than he did God. I think it would have been a very short story. Our time, our choices, our lifestyle will all be affected by our perspective on eternity. And lastly, I just want to say lastly, um, I think the fourth thing is mission. Mission and evangelism sharing the good news of Jesus, whatever you want to call it. When we live in light of eternity, it should drive us to mission. It should drive us to evangelism like never before. It should. The thought that my friends and my colleagues and my neighbours and members of my family are living lives for the now, with no knowledge sometimes or even understanding of the consequences of their life, of eternity, just that should motivate me and it should motivate you to action. When you live in light of eternity, you will share the gospel like you've never done before. Because what is at stake here is so much more than my reputation, my kudos, my image. It's about an eternity that we will all, each and every one of us, experience beyond physical death. The question is, are my friends going to be living in the goodness of God, or are they going to be living void of all the goodness of God? And that should, brothers and sisters, lead us to feel almost physically sick in our stomach when we think about all the people around us who do not know Jesus, and the reality for them is that they will, too, live on for all eternity, but not with Jesus, not being able to sing and celebrate and praise God the way that we did a moment ago. That should drive us to mission and sharing the gospel. Folks, I think the church has been fooled into thinking that we have a dull, weak, irrelevant gospel. It's a lie. It's an absolute lie. And if we look too much at the here and now, and we take our eyes off of eternity, we'll settle for getting by. We'll settle for just looking for that moment when we die, instead of waging war and declaring the truth that the gospel is powerful and it is what it is. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for I am convinced that it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. The question is, how will they hear unless we tell them? And how will you tell them if you're living for this? We have to. We have to, church. We have to live our lives in light of eternity. Because if you don't, if you don't, you will just stumble along in life, void of the power that God, the Spirit of God, has put in your heart and your soul. We have to take this seriously. There's never been an easier time. Can I just say, I, John Mayer said this to me the other day, and I was challenged. He said, there has never, ever been an easier time for us to share our faith. He said this, says, people right now are desperate for some good news. And you're the carriers of that good news. The question is, in light of eternity, are we going to be sharers of that news and be serious about mission? Let's stand up. I'm just going to pray for us, and then I'm just going to...
Hold on, sorry. Okay. Um, I just I just want to talk very briefly to two groups of people. Why don't you just, if you're happy to, just maybe just close your eyes. It just helps you not to get distracted. And the first the first people I'm going to pray for is the church, us, many of us. Father, we just say we are sorry where at any point we have lived in a mindset of today. That you only live once, and this is what it's all about. We say, Lord God, will you forgive us? Because we know that actually having faith, being believers of you, even these guys that are getting baptized today, is them saying it's not about this life, it's about the eternity to come. It's about my life going on with you because they're hidden in Christ. We say, God, help us change our mindset. Forgive us. We repent and we say, Lord, help us in our suffering. Thank you that you are the God of all comfort. But thank you, Lord God, that you, you hate our pain and our suffering so much that you sent your son to die. It's not that you don't care. You really care. And you've done everything necessary that for all eternity we can walk into the peace of you. No more tears. No more pain. No more suffering. That's what you've won for us. But in the day right here, right now, I just say, would you help us to fix our minds on you and to live in light of eternity? Lord God, help us to be the most generous people that our friends know. Help us, Lord God, to take faith-filled steps of obedience because we're not so focused on the image of those people that have put on us and our reputation, but we have a reputation that we're sadly, we'll happily give it all away in order to find life and riches in eternity. And God, give us a heart for the lost. Give us a heart for the lost, I pray. For those people that are going to go on for eternity without knowing you, I say, would you put something in the pit of our stomach where we just have to share the good news of Jesus that they are all looking for. Do all of these things, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And just very briefly, I, just, I know that there will be many people here, people online that don't know Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would stir their heart to ponder these things. We know that you are not a God who pushes on us, but you are a God who has done everything required to come arms distant from us. And I pray for every dear person here, every friend, every family member, everyone that we care about who is here today and online. We say, Lord God, would you give them the courage to just take that first step and say, I'm happy to listen. I'm happy to know more. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you are a non-believer, if you, if you don't know Jesus personally, or maybe you feel like actually you've lived your life for the here and now, I would personally love to talk to you afterwards. But more than that, I would love to invite you to Alpha. I'm going to be leading Alpha this term, and it starts on the 7th of October. It's just for seven evenings um, on the Thursday evening. I would really encourage you to come with your questions and ask. Even if you're not sure, just best come and ask because this is going to be the most significant moment and decision that you can make in your life. Guys, thank you so much for listening.